Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Eastern Tallgrass Prairie and Big Rivers Landscape Conservation Cooperative Spring Webinar Series. My name is Gwen White and I'm the Science Coordinator for the Tallgrass Prairie uh, LCC. Our coordinator, Kelly Myers, is out this week at the North American Fish and Wildlife Conference. We typically hold these webinars at 2 o'clock Eastern Time on Wednesdays through the spring, and I believe we have a, a lineup that runs all the way through early April. Um, today, uh, we'll, we uh, welcome the coordinators of two very important communities of practice for the lower Midwest. As many of you know, the focal areas for the LCC are uh, prairie conservation, river conservation, agroecology, and urban conservation, which we refer to as ecological places and cities. So two of those uh, areas, prairie conservation and river conservation, have uh, communities of practice that are informal groups of, of scientists and managers that have been uh, gathering in monthly uh, online meetings and hosting workshops and other activities. The first is the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative that's working on prairie conservation uh, techniques and technologies and sharing those experiences. We'll be hearing about that today. And secondly, the Floodplain Science Network is an informal uh, group that's coordinated by Kristen Busca and uh, they also share information about floodplain restoration and uh, policy, science, management, and other opportunities across the Midwest. So without further ado, um, I will be turning the webinar over to Abby Donnelly, who is our coordinator for these webinars. And I just want to remind everyone that the webinars are being recorded. We uh, will likely have time for questions, but just keep in mind that the webinar is recorded. So Abby, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Gwen. Um, just a quick reminder, everyone on the line, if you could mute your phone so we don't have any feedback, uh, if you can figure out how to mute your phone, star six. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started with Amanda McCulpin. She for the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative. Go ahead, Amanda. Okay, okay. Uh, I thought I was going second. Sorry. Oh, my gosh. You're so right. So sorry. <laughs> We're going to get started with Kristen Busca with the Floodplain Science Network. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, Abby. And thank you, Gwen. Um, so I'm, I'm going to share a little bit of background about um, this group um, that was formed before my time, the Floodplain Science Network. Um, I'm very proud to serve as a facilitator for this network. It's, uh, uh, it, it's a group of scientists and researchers biologists and managers, and, um, and some policy experts um, that really come together, I think, to learn from one another in regards to floodplain science policy and different restoration and conservation approaches. Um, we have roughly 80 or 85 members um, that, you know, some of them are, are regular, uh, regular folks that engage others once every once in a while. Um, but what, I, what I've gained from this network, and I've heard this from some of our members, is by having um, kind of a broad interdisciplinary um, perspectives available in some of our discussions, it really helps wrap your, your mind around um, why floodplains are in the state that they are in many of our rivers, and um, also helps you think about um, maybe alternative futures for our floodplains and what that might look like. So um, I'm going to give you kind of an, a broad overview of um, how the network was formed and what we generally do, and then some of our, um, our thoughts about uh, our future. So because I don't know everyone's background, I'm going to give you two slides <laughs> that, is very basic, that are very basic. Um, first, what is a floodplain? When, when I'm talking about floodplains, I'm generally referring to those lands that are adjacent to the river that are intermittently inundated under natural conditions. So um, that may not be every spring or whenever the, the kind of high flood pulse um, comes, but maybe it's every couple of years. Um, it's some sort of intermittent, um, 
inundation that occurs in, in these lands. And I say natural under natural conditions because many of our large rivers um, nationwide and across the world have become separated from their floodplains. So just the Mississippi River here um, and the Illinois River, you would have um, the Missouri coming in down by St. Louis and down at the far end here we have the Ohio River would be coming in here. And those red areas are the portions of the floodplain that are separated um, from the river due to levees. Um, and those levees were constructed to keep, you know, essentially to keep water off the floodplains so they, those floodplains could be used for a variety of human, um, human uses, for agriculture, for urban and residential development, and so forth. Um, over time, um, what we've seen, at least in the Midwest, um, Midwestern United States, is that flooding events, well, I should, I should just go back here. So these, these levees, in case you know, folks aren't familiar, the levees basically line the river, and they, um, they stop this, this um, flood of water from um, kind of extending over its banks. So it's, it's removing that flood storage capacity that floodplains have um, historically. So um, over time, uh, what we've been seeing is that flood events um, have become more frequent and intense and expensive under um, climate change um, scenarios, uh, we're also looking towards um, kind of a, a more frequent and increased magnitude of these events, as well as <laughs> the alternate uh, events of, of drought. So um, so we've been experiencing this rise in flood events. At the same time, I would say in the last 30 years, we've really, uh, from the scientific community, we've really started um, recognizing that these floodplains have a real role. Um, of, in this situation, they have a flood risk reduction role by storing those floodwaters, but that periodic inundation allows materials from the river and the floodplain to be exchanged, and those wet dry cycles support the biogeochemical processing um, that makes these floodplains so fertile and productive. Uh, floodplains are also known to provide spawning and nursing conditions for fishes, given that the inundation occurs at the, at the right time of year. Um, it provides um, foraging resources for a broad diversity of birds um, and, and, and a number of different other species that utilize that kind of aquatic terrestrial transition zone. So we've gained um, both conceptual and now more in more recent years, we've really gained um, um, a real understanding with, with, with not just conceptual understanding, but um, with, with data that we've been able to collect to, to put numbers on these things and to realize that these, these are really um, ecologically uh, productive uh, areas that um, may have multiple benefits in, in their restoration. So in, again, in the history of large rivers, we've, we've always kind of leaned more on this economic development of, of the river at the sort of at the sake of some of the ecological aspects. So now that we're in a situation where flood events, I think people are realizing more and more um, the risk um, that's involved with living um, behind a levee. Um, we're seeing maybe opportunities to balance that out with some um, with some floodplain reconnection here or there. And as that happens, there are cases where this is, is occurring, it's slow, <laughs> um, but we have opportunities to then learn more about um, that, the role of those, those restored floodplains. So this is, this is all happening in the last couple um, decades, with this, our understanding is gaining, our, our, our understanding of risk and so forth. Um, there are also some other things that kind of led to the jump start of this network itself. So um, within the Mississippi River, something that was really a, kind of a, a mover here was the passing of the Water Resources Development Act of 2007. It included language that, that, that said essentially that floodplain restoration could be included as, um, as a habitat restoration enhancement project within the upper Mississippi River. And that's a you know within certain pots of money that are available for restoration. Um, we've also 
seen this um, systemic collection, not just in the Upper Mist, but in many other rivers of LIDAR. And what that allows us to do is to really um, investigate and learn about the biophysical and ecological aspects of our floodplains. So just an example on the right, this is some work from Nate Dieger and colleagues here at, at UMESC, where what you're seeing, the different colors are the, the different, um, I guess, duration of, of flood inundation. And their work has really shown that this duration of flood inundation is strongly correlated to the floodplain vegetation communities. And so we're learning quite a bit about um, you know, what's driving these differences in these floodplains and, and things like that from this, this systemic data. So um, a group of river ecologists, including um, Ken Lubinsky, who, uh, who is a former facilitator for this network, um, came together in 2012. Um, they had a, a survey where they were trying to gain some understanding of what kind of science information do we need to better understand our rivers and our floodplains. Um, and then they, they led a workshop as well. And what they came away was came away with was this need for communication among scientists and science users. So um, the floodplain science was was born from these. Um, conversations. The intentions of the network were really to facilitate coordination um, among individuals, institutions, disciplines, um, and start integrating um, these different ways of thinking to promote the use of science in some of our management and um, decision-making um, processes. Um, another aspect that we haven't been as good about, I will be the uh, first to admit this, is communicating some of the science more effectively to non-scientific audiences. I can't say the network has done that, but I can say that I have seen um, many of the nonprofits that are uh, part of this network um, start to do a really a better job <laughs> than any uh, than the network as a whole. Um, so that that's kind of the idea behind the the network. Um, let's see here. The original facilitators, when this started, uh, I think, you know, in, in 2013 is when they really started the network. In 2012, they had this, this workshop and they identified the need. But in 2013, they kicked it off with um, a series of monthly conference calls where um, Ken Lubinsky, who is who's now retired from USGS, Andy Kasper, who is still a facilitator, he's with Illinois Natural History Survey, and Carrie Davis, who um, is no longer a facilitator, uh, but she's at the University of Iowa, they would um, host monthly calls and kind of get updates about projects within the Upper Mississippi River Basin um, and, and share technical knowledge and, and updates on that, that sort of thing. And then I think they, they expanded to more, um, to more kind of trying to, trying to understand these different um, projects that are ongoing and how they're designed and um, some of the policy sides of things and some of the initiatives that different organizations have so that we could kind of gain this better understanding of where we all are. There's a lot of different moving pieces um, and kind of getting everybody on the same page of what's all going on is, is really helpful. Um, and it kind, of, it kind of in some way builds some momentum um, and helps you know who to contact for um, for questions that people have done this before. So um, currently, Andy Casper and I facilitate the network. We host um, a series of different um, uh, presentations. We, we usually have a, a monthly call where we invite someone to present uh, about a project or, or uh, some work that they're doing within the floodplain. Um, and we've expanded beyond the upper mist trying to include folks down south in the lower Mississippi as well as the Missouri River um, to kind of broaden our, our thoughts. And, and, and perhaps in the future we'll broaden even further to the west coast where they're doing quite a bit of floodplain uh, reconnection. And um, let's see, in 2016 when I, I've been a part of the network for maybe two years, um, and in 2016 I asked our membership um, through kind of like an online survey, you know, what, what do you want from this network? <laughs> Are we fulfilling our mission? 
um, we're voluntary. We're not funded. We do we do provide support, technical support from the Eastern Tallgrass Prairie and Big Rivers LCC, and we appreciate that greatly. Um, but this is a very um, loose network of folks that come together um, because they care about floodplains and they they want to learn more. Um, and so um, it's there's there's no funding source attached to that. Um, so in, in 2016, there were some, um, I guess, the, the feedback that we got from our members was that people really wanted more face-to-face -face opportunities. Uh, it's, it's different when you're calling on a conference call versus talking to people. The collaboration that you can, can receive from face-to-face -face interactions um, is, is just, it's a totally different ballgame than, than talking on the phone. Um, Folks wanted to work on a collaborative paper on research needs, in addition to developing some sort of research framework that individuals within the network could pull from and work on and, and build together. Um, there, are, um, there were ideas to communicate the science outside the network and how do we start doing that, um, kind of developing a strategy to do that. Um, let's see, there was also some folks who wanted to work on identifying barriers to floodplain conservation. And then finally, we do have a website, which I'll share in just a moment here. Um, folks thought about restructuring that website so that we are, we're really more about resource sharing um, and being able to share the information that we are learning in our individual projects, um, kind of a bank for all this, this information. Um, just yesterday, um, American Rivers, which is um, participating in the Floodplain Science Network, um, their national and nonprofit, they led a workshop on identifying policy barriers to floodplain conservation, and um, I guess even more broadly, you know, how do we really build a movement for floodplain conservation and restoration? And so it's really great seeing some of the partners take a little bit more leadership role here or there, um, and bring in more people. Um, what we plan to do, um, myself and Andy, as facilitators in this next year, is we're, we're really seeking to start working on collaborative proposals. So instead of just, um, you know, sharing information, can we actually work with one another in the network to, um, to work on understanding floodplains together um, in a, almost like a bigger picture? Um, looking at some of the socio-ecological aspects um, of what, um, what kind of information um, we need to understand to better work with landowners, um, to develop conservation programs um, t more targeted at floodplains. Um, so those are some of the things that we hope to do within the next two years. Um, meanwhile, we'll continue to have our monthly conference calls. Um, what usually happens is I send out an email <laughs> with who we have um, talking. Next week, in fact, we have um, Eileen Shader from American Rivers. She's going to be giving a recap of that workshop that we had yesterday um, to share uh, with members who um, there are only maybe five or so members that were in attendance. So sharing that more broadly and getting feedback and things like that. Um, so we usually have a webinar every second Tuesday of the month, and then following that, we generally have discussion and updates from folks who want to share any kind of new information or um, that they've they found with their own projects or whatnot. And we usually it's usually about an hour. So if anyone's interested in, in joining this network, um, feel free to email me. There, we do have a website, but it is a little outdated. Um, we are we, we're working on finding a volunteer to help us revamp that. Um, so if you have any technical skills and you would like to um, assist, we welcome that as well. So um, I think that brings me to my 20 minutes. So I hope I was able to cover most of um, what I needed. But if there's any questions, I'd be happy to entertain those now. Uh, thank 
you so much, Kristen. Um, if we don't have any more questions, uh, be sure to check our website for Kristen's contact information in case you need to uh, email her with your website making skills. Um, <laughs> but coming up next, we have we finally have Amanda. McCulpin. She's a contractor for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and she's a project coordinator for uh, the Prairie Reconstructive Initi Reconstruction Initiative and also the Forest Invasives Adaptive Management Project. So if you're ready, Amanda, you can get going. Okay, sure. Can I just grab the control? Uh, I'm passing it to you now. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here. As um, Abby said, I'm Amanda McCulpin, Project Coordinator for the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative. Um, and first Sorry, of all, I'm Real quick, can you share your screen with us, please? Oh, shoot, I thought I had. Uh -huh. oh, hold on, hold on. It's the old, click the actual share. There you go, thank you so there much. You go. Got it. There's always something. Okay, so um, actually, first of all, I'd like to thank the Eastern Tallgrass Prairie and Big Rivers um, Landscape Conservation Cooperative, not just for this webinar series, for us to be able to um, highlight our work here, but also um, they are hosting our webpage <coughs> on the LCC website. And so if you go to visit the um, LCC website, you can find um, links to our, our web page there. And so today I'm going to give you some background about our group and bring you up to date about our current projects and how you can get involved with us. Um, and before I started, I wanted to clarify that um, when we use the word reconstruction for the prairie reconstruction work, we're talking about um, planting prairie where it no longer exists. Um, often that's on former crop fields or non-native pasture. Um, in other words, we're, we're starting from scratch, kind of a distinct set of problems from trying to um, work on remnant prairies. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so um, this group began because they realized they had a common problem um, when implementing the reconstructions they were doing. Um, some turned out to be really great, and others definitely did not. Um, and many were, or perhaps most, were somewhere in between. Um, here I've pictured a particularly discouraging site full of bull thistle um, in the upper right, and then as well as uh, you know a fairly nice site in the first year or two after planting that seems to be progressing pretty nicely. Um, but then the question is, why? Um, it was not at all clear exactly what factors were leading to success. So about four or five years ago, a small group of practitioners um, came together to address these uncertainties. Um, so their questions were, you know, how can we learn together from our experiences at trying to do these reconstructions? Um, the group went through a structured decision-making process um, to try to clarify the problem, um, and work on what the goals were and the approach that uh, we would take. Um, during the last year or so, uh, Paul Charland and I have come on as co-coordinators for the group, and that's really helped kind of progress and coalesce um, some of the projects that we've been working on. Okay, so the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative, um, we developed the mission, which was to involve a diverse community of practitioners so that we could learn collaboratively to reduce our uncertainties and improve our reconstructions. Our vision is that future reconstructions are biologically diverse in terms of both plants and animals, that they're ecologically functional, they resist invasion by non-native plants, and they're time efficient and cost effective to implement and manage. So our group 
um, the PRI members, well, for the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative, um, PRI, and um, our members work for a number of different conservation organizations, and some are private landowners. Um, we work across, we, or we have members across the Prairie region, although um, most of our kind of current active members are kind of in the, that kind of central swath that's um, kind of from Illinois up toward the Dakotas. Um, but we are looking forward to working with other people throughout the Prairie region. So as a group, um, we recognize that reconstructing prairie is essential. So obviously most of the original prairie is gone, so we, what we need to do is plant prairie to support our goals that might be related to plants or maybe to pollinators or grass and birds or nesting waterfowl or the other goals that we have related to the prairie dependent species. And then in order to be most effective, we need to improve our technique. <clears throat> And I, I do want to mention that many of you will um, be familiar with um, the PREOC group, and that's essentially the core group. It's the, the Prairie Reconstruction, Reconstruction Initiative Advisory Team, and that core group of approximately 20 or so practitioners, um, and there's been, you know, changing personnel over the years, but they're the ones that kind of are uh, the worker bees of the association, of the Association. They they are um, directing the the work and kind of coming up with the projects and and a lot of times those same individuals are working on the sub teams that we organized um, and the the pre op group itself those that smaller core group is also a diverse group so these are some of the organizations that that group works works for. Um, and other broader organizations that are involved with the broader PRI group include, you know, county level people, other state level organizations, um, private lands biologists from um, other NGOs. So we realized that what we had was um, we needed to know what was going on with these reconstructions to um, better interpret and better better um, address address our uncertainties. And so we realized that in order to interpret the results we were having, the outcomes we were having in the field, what we needed to know were details about what happened, as well as specifically where and when it happened. So um, some of you... Okay. Um, you may have heard Diane Larson's call, uh, talk last week where she talked about the retrospective study that we worked on. So specifically, we were focused on two sites, and we thought that those two sites had good, solid historical records related to planting and management. Um, and they did. However, there were some important gaps in that information also. So we learned that sometimes that important information was missing. and. Specifically, one of the issues was we didn't always know the spatial extent or intensity of a given management action. So in order to work on a solution to this, a team was assembled to um, develop a database where we can record information related to the site and its history, the planting event, and ongoing management actions. So in this database, each smallest level site within the database is planted with one seed mix. And that's what we call like the seed mix area. So these smaller seed mix areas may be nested within a bigger management unit. In other words, you know, there might be an upland mix planted in one portion of the unit and a lowland mix in the other. And so it's a way of, of trying to uh, make sure that the way we record the data includes that information about where the different seed mixes go. And um, we also, in the database, we have this capability of attaching maps or other figures, and that map there at the bottom of the screen with the yellow squiggly lines, that came from uh, Ben Walker and up at Glacial Ridge uh, National Wildlife Refuge. And just this past week, they were doing a planting, and he put some iPads in the tractors and had it trace, 
you know, where the tractors went. So here he has this really great information now that he knows exactly where these seed mixes went. So um, that's kind of the database that we've been working on to help us organize um, especially that planting and management information. But of course, um, how will we know whether we were successful? You know, can we tie that outcome back to the management regime? So clearly we need to develop a monitoring framework to help us answer um, these questions and, and also other questions that we have. So we also have a sub-team that has been working together to develop a series a set of monitoring protocols. And what we're working on are nesting, these nested protocols that are kind of telescoping. And they, um, so they require different effort and expertise, but they also answer different questions. Um, two critical questions we have are, did what I plant come up? and in the same re relative proportions as I planted it? And then also, what kinds of invasive plant problems do I have um, that might require management intervention? And of course, we have many other questions also that we're working to get our monitoring protocols to help us answer our questions effectively. So one key, of course, is to link the monitoring to the database. So there will be a monitoring module within the database, um, and we'll be able to connect that then to the prior man planting and management data that had, you know, that we had already entered. And then with enough data, we should be able to learn collectively to reduce our uncertainties regarding our prairie plantings. Um, I want to emphasize too that the way that we're kind of conceptualizing the the database and the monitoring is that um, you can use the database without necessarily using the monitoring protocols, but really to get the best um, and the most learning, you would use them together. But we also recognize that not everybody has the capability of doing the monitoring um, maybe every year, or they might not have the botanical expertise to do this type of intensive vegetation monitoring. And then we're hoping to eventually get some um, funding in place to do a concerted monitoring effort throughout um, the, the people that had, had entered data so that we could kind of link the monitoring to a broader set of um, sites. So in terms of where we are, um, the database, we've had, we've developed it, and then we had feedback um, here recently from some preliminary testers, and we are working on revisions, and those are underway, and we're hoping to expand that to a broader set of contributors sometime in the next couple of months. So we're hoping to excite some of you into um, considering joining us and checking out the database and, and um, contributing data from your plantings. And then in terms of the monitoring pr protocols, as I said, those are still under development. Um, we're planning on enlisting a, a small number of field testers this coming summer um, and then make further revisions based on that. And, and we're hoping that those protocols will be finalized later on this year. And I do want to mention that another major um, uh, project we have, or focus that we have, is, is um, organizing field days where um, we facilitate learning amongst pra practitioners by um, going to these focused field days where uh, the practitioners can interact with each other in the field, discuss uh, successes, failures, questions they're struggling with. Um, last year we had three field days um, in various parts of the region or the, the area. And um, the topics included, you know, how, how do we successfully create these diverse reconstructions that we're aiming for. Um, Diane Larson uh, went to Glacial Ridge and talked about insights that she had from 
for, for, for at that time preliminary analysis of the um, data from her research. Um, and then also, how do we how do we take existing plantings, and that might have um, be dominated by grasses, and try to increase the form diversity or or just the diversity in general. And then um, for this coming year, planning is underway as we speak for the field days. So that is um, another way for people to get involved with our group. And so we invite you to join. So. Stay in touch if you're interested in um, either the field days or just kind of getting some uh, news from us. Paul Charland is um, the one who is organizing and, and keeping our email list up to date. And he generally sends out the um, big mailings, but they don't occur that often. Like he sent out one as a reminder for this event. Um, also, as I said in, in the first slide, the um, LCC website has information about the PRI group and our efforts. And also, if you're interested in, in more information about the um, database, feel free to contact me. Um, and all of us have Fish and Wildlife Service addresses. Um, and the monitoring protocols, stay tuned. Um, hopefully, we'll have those out by sometime by late this fall. And so they'd be ready, ready to go for next next season. And then um, Pauline Drobny is our science coordinator, so feel free also to contact Pauline. And then I guess with that, I'll um, open it up to any questions. I'll go if nobody else is. You bet. Uh, this is Scott Hamilton out of Missouri. Um, you uh, obviously um, are in the process of amassing some protocols for monitoring and so forth. I'm, I'm wondering if you have um, information on milestones or goals as far as uh, diversity in year X or something like that or the degree of invasives or, or anything that would amount to something I can put in some of my monitoring uh, protocols for something to shoot for. Do you guys collect any of that kind of information? So, um, what, well, I, I, well, I would say that what we're trying to work on with um, these protocols is, is a little more than the, doc, the documentation of what is there because, you know, what, what the milestone would be would be different for different people. So, so you know, um, depending on who you are and what your budget is and what your goals are, you might have, you know, already started with a different kind of mix or, or you know, you might be restricted to different techniques. Um, so I would say we would probably hesitate somewhat to um, kind of put, put milestones that would say, well, you ought to have, you know, 20 species showing up by the third year. Um, and I. I personally don't have tons of experience with the reconstructions themselves, so if there's somebody on the line that, that is, you know, part of our group that would like to respond to Scott's question. Sure, I'll take a shot at that. that. This is Pauline Drabney, and um, yeah, I think, um, Amanda, I would agree with what Amanda's saying. So what we're trying to do is sort of try to understand what are the things that contribute to uh, what we would call a successful prairie, and success can be defined by many different um, as, by many different things, and, and one of them, as Amanda mentioned, is did, did the thing. This came up with among all of the people who are doing prey plantings. Did what I plant come up? You know, and 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 did it come up better? I see this one planting, and it is absolutely gorgeous. I want to bottle that. You know, how do I figure out what I did? in order to repeat that. And, and or, you know, I see one that's just absolutely horrible, like the one slide Amanda had of all the thistles in the in the prairie planting. And I don't want to do that again, but I, what did we do? And, you know, I've heard these kinds of conversations uh, by um, um, uh, managers with their staff kind of trying to figure out the answers to these questions. And so what we're really trying to do um, you know, one of the things that, that makes us understand whether, makes us, uh, the way we can get at what did we do to make this 
a really good planting or not is understand what factors contributed to the the creation of that particular prairie planting. And so I think you can probably you could probably begin to tie some of those um, things to some of the some of the monitoring would be useful for you in terms of answering your specific questions. We're not going to try to answer all questions for all people, but these monitoring protocols are going to be um, flexible enough, I think, that you'll be able to use them in some of your own specific uh, your own specific um, um, management questions, answering some of those. That makes sense. Okay. We have time for some more questions if there are any out there. If you have any questions also for Kristen, um, I believe she's still on the line, so if you didn't get a chance earlier. Okay, thank you so much, Amanda, for uh, all the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative updates. Um, if anyone wants to get involved in either the Floodplain Science Network or the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative, um, please check out our website and you can find all of the contact information for both of these groups. Uh, and so next week we have presentations for two of our focal areas for the LCC. We have Christian Shaw, um, she is one of the staff members of our LCC. She's talking about the urban conservation and ecological places and cities network. And we also have Andrew Stevenson, who's the project coordinator at the Center of the Center for Social and Behavioral Research at the University of Northern Iowa. He's also our agroecology technical advisory group coordinator, um, and he'll talk about the agroecology work that they have going on in the future. For any previous webinars that we've done in this series or for the recording of this webinar, they're posted on our website at tallgrassprairielcc.org. If you look under resources in the webinars, you'll find all the recordings. Um, we hope you can join us for next week, the 15th of March at 2 p.m. Eastern. And thank you all for joining us this week, and thank you for the presenters. Thank you, Abby.